Ladies and gentlemen, boys and berries, this is Magic Brad here for The Magic Brad Show. And I've got a friend that I've been a friend for a long time. I'm going to bring him on. And he just recently finished a book that he's been working on for a while. And his name is John Ivan Palmer. Let's bring him on. John Ivan Palmer, how are you? I'm just fine, just fine. Oh, you want a round of applause? We'll do that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, give myself some applause. We might as well. You know, we deserve it. I'm going to slide you over the other side over here because I can do that. See, you make a little switch thing. Yeah, okay. Oh, makes my head dizzy. Okay. I Don't know. That's the internet these days. Let me uh, close the door, too. There we go. Now we got some privacy here in the studio. What do you think of this COVID thing? Uh, well, you know, strangely, it uh, aside from not being able to perform any shows or to do a book tour, which is the book tour especially is, is uh, disappointing, but uh, otherwise it doesn't really change my life very much at all uh, because I stay at home and, you know, work at home and spend a lot of my time writing and, and reading. So uh, doesn't really change very much. I go to fewer, well, I don't go to any movies. Uh, we go to almost no restaurants unless we can sit outside. But, uh, you know, the adaptation to it is not uh, real drastic, in my case, at least. I know for other people it is. For a lot of people that had to be in front of people, like people in the hospitality industry, and my event planner expo made it March 4th, just under the wire. Yeah. 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 No, March 4th. My, last, my last show was just about that time. Exactly. It all just kind of collapsed. But yeah. what are you going to do? You just got to deal with it and innovate. So, you know, yeah. we've known each other for a really long time. I remember I helped you with some of your county fairs, and that was a lot of fun, this whole whole entertainment business. And now you've got this book that you wrote, and the book is more about your father, correct? Uh, it's about growing up with my father, yes. It's about me and him both. Sure. And I'm, I'm assuming that was um, it's quite an interesting childhood because – being an entertainer, you're always moving around. You're always going to different places. Well, that's right. I grew up in a trailer, and uh, I lived in maybe five or six different places every week. <laughs> Some people might move that many times in a lifetime, but uh, that was a typical week for me, and that went on for years. Now, how, how long did it take? How long have you been working on this book? Has it, has it taken a long time? Uh, you know, I first conceived the book when I lived in San Francisco. That was back in the 60s. I didn't start writing it until maybe five years ago, and I wrote different versions of it. And uh, the, the final version that uh, has just been published, I think I, I worked on that for maybe uh, two years. Wow. You know, Monica's in the process of writing a book, my wife Monica, and... Uh... I've, I've been to some of these things where they say, you know, write your book in a weekend. Yeah. That's not a, that's a myth, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, go ahead and try. See how far it gets you. <laughs> she, she's been writing her book for a while. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah it, it's a difficult process. Uh, the writing part and then even more difficult is the publication part. Oh, whether you're self-published it or from a publisher? Well, self-publishing is no problem. If you got the money, I mean, there's a thousand places willing to take it. But, you know, to find a legitimate publisher, that's an agent. And, you know, they're, you know a publisher via an agent, that's more difficult. <laughs> Too many uh, variables. The, well, yeah, a lot of them, the obstacles, actually. And competition, because a thousand other people will want to do the same thing, or 10,000 other people. So the book is basically um, your life growing up as a uh, gypsy for all practical purposes, right? Uh, very similar lifestyle. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the first uh, part of the book. But the book does evolve into something uh, much deeper and much darker, especially the last half. And that's uh, when it comes to my adaptation to the real world where I'm no longer living at home and I have to get out and live like other people. And uh, that's when things start to get uh, spooky. Oh, well, I, I never, uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's uh, a lot different than a person that's uh, 
living at home and they have a home base and then they go off into the world and kicked out of the nest, so to speak. But your situation of being around a lot of unfamiliar things constantly, you went into another unfamiliar territory, right? Uh, well, yeah, unfamiliar uh, way of living, let's say, uh, and, and uh, let's say uh, bringing a state of mind into a world of other people whose states of mind are completely different. So it took a very, very long time for me to interface with that, and I'm you know, still working on it to some degree of success. <laughs> You know, when I was a kid, I uh, there was a local carnival that I went and worked at for a couple of weeks. And the carnies, the way that they treat people, they're always playing jokes on them and having them do certain things like, hey, there's a quarter down there. Oh, you're stepping on it. And they had me dancing around. There was no freaking quarter, but they're just jacking around with you. Did you get a lot of like that kind of stuff as a kid with all the other entertainers playing around? Uh, you know Carnies don't do that among other carnies. Okay, <laughs> so the joke's on me then, right? Entertainers don't do that among other entertainers, <laughs> generally speaking. <laughs> Although uh, there are some exceptions, uh, including yourself, uh, Mr. Goodham. I know you've pulled a few fast ones on me, uh, which I've always appreciated. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you tend to do it on, on people who are unawares because you want to kind of trap people or gives you a sense of power that you really don't have, but it gives you the illusion of it. Okay, so you were part of the family of uh, traveling entertainers, so. Right, right, and very few children traveled that way uh, because it's hard to raise children on the road like that, especially if there's more than one. I was an only child, so it was a little bit easier. And uh, my family had to bring me along because my mother was in the act, so there was no real place to put me except to uh, bring me along and <laughs> stick me in the dressing room and tell me to be quiet. It's definitely a different world because I know you had hooked me up with Jose Cole's International Circus as the ringmaster for a couple of weeks. Uh -huh, sure. And that was an experience in and of itself, being with a bunch of Spanish-speaking humans and I didn't know what the heck to do. And then we're going to these teeny little towns that uh, there's a you know, population 300, so there's no nothing to do. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember he was known as Cole. He actually pronounced the last uh, E on his name. He was just known as Jose. Our man is Cole. Uh, didn't even use the first name. It was just Cole. And he was uh, a hand balancer and was famous for standing on one finger. And we did many, many shows with him. And uh, he was a big, uh, big idol of mine. I always liked hand balancers because they were doing something that uh, was difficult to do and they were doing a, a, a defying gravity in a delicate way and uh, and winning. Not easy. I always wanted to be a hand balancer, but I never never developed the sufficient skill. Well, there, there's another local guy here that does some of that. Um, Craig Carlson, he does some hand balancing. Yes, uh, Craig. So when you got out into the real world, so to speak, what did where where were you living? Where did you go? Well, I was in high school. At that time, my parents were getting divorced, and uh, custody was going back and forth between my mother and my father. Both of them were living a transient life, so we were, you know, we were all still as transient as we ever were, except all three of us separately. So I spent a lot of my time uh, while my father was out of town. If I was in you know, his custody, I, I'd be living in a, a sleeping room or a hotel or something. And uh, with my mother, I'd be in her whatever apartment she happened to be in that week because she, she moved around uh, quite a bit. Well, it was not real stable. So I was uh, basically living in the world uh, by the time I was maybe 14 or 15. And I never really thought of myself as being that different. I just wanted to fit in. I didn't take my, my past and bring it out in front of me and examine it. That didn't happen until many years later. So there were many situations that I was in that uh, didn't work out for me. They were embarrassing in one way or another, uh, or got me into some kind of trouble. But I wasn't really aware that the reason for that was that I just wasn't like other people. I was like I moved from a 
some tribe in the in the Amazon and suddenly I'm living in civilization trying to figure things out. So, you know, I've done some work with you and kind of helped you with some of your things. Um, and I noticed that in the world that you live in, you're very, very detail oriented, way more detail oriented than I am. Um, like you would, when you do your hypnotic shows, you got uh, a list of all the things that you've done before. So you don't end up repeating effects for the same audience and your, your props and things are very specific and meticulous and, and uh, where did you learn that? Is, was that, I mean, I don't know if, did you learn that from working with your dad or was, did you learn that when you got into the real world and found out, you know, you got to be able to know how to fold your clothes and put them in the right spot and organize them? Did you learn it in life or did you learn that from your dad? I guess mostly I learned it from uh, hard experience that if you don't do that, uh, you're going to run into trouble on stage and there's nothing you can do at that point. You, you can't go back and start over again. So it's best. It's like, like taking a, like, like going into outer space or making a trip to the moon. You have to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect before you take off. So you don't run into any trouble along the way. And I think most acts were that way. I don't know if I learned it from them. Maybe I, maybe I did without really knowing I was learning it. Uh, but certainly acts were very, very particular about their props. That's why there was this taboo against uh, having anything to do with anybody else's props. You, know, you don't look at them, you don't touch them, you don't move them. They, you just uh, keep your distance and they are taboo. And I can see why, because if you move one little thing or something gets nudged over or some little mechanism gets uh, displaced, and that could be a real problem for somebody uh, trying to perform in front of a thousand people. Yeah, I know that uh, when I was packing up my act after a show, people would ask, for, you want some help? And it's kind of like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. everything and everything has its place. I'll take care of it. So just yeah, I get that too. Yeah, and, and I ne never wanted anybody to uh, help me. I'd rather make several trips and make sure it's all done right. And especially, especially if somebody wants to use my microphone, <laughs> that's always no. You can't use my mic. In fact, I even tell people in advance because I always use my own sound system, uh, knowing from experience that you can't rely on other people's sound systems. Uh, so I tell them before I start the show that if you are going to use any, or you know, need a, a sound system, a microphone, after I'm done, please set up your own. Uh, I said, you, you can't use mine. And people take that sometimes uh, not well, <laughs> but it's, it's a necessity. I mean, you don't go into an operating room and, you know, borrow the surgeon's scalpel. <laughs> Else. <laughs> the peel a <of> potato. <laughs> right. Just, you know, you keep your hands off and you stay away. Oh, well, yeah. Then they don't understand that you're supposed to be getting to the next gig, and while they're doing their little drawing or giveaway using your microphone, yeah, your, your thousand dollar or two thousand dollar microphone. <laughs> well, yeah, and also people don't know how to use that kind of equipment. They right. drop it or they'll set it down or. Uh, set it on a table and it'll roll off and hit the floor. I mean, all kinds of things can happen. Exactly. And so, nobody wishes to re uh, reimburse you if you have to buy a whole new system. This is probably a silly question, but do you have a copy of your book present? Uh, this is it right, right here. There we go. There's the book. The Master of Deception, John Ivan Palmer. And there's also a... Uh, audiobook version too. It looks like you're getting some reflection there. Uh, there, that's the audiobook version. That will happen. I'll throw this little uh, thing up here. That's what it's called. It's called Master of Deception. And I'm assuming this is available on Amazon? Yeah, it's in any bookstore, Amazon. Probably the best deal is at a uh, book uh, seller called bookshop.org. And you can get it at a discount, and there's no shipping. So you save a little bit there. But otherwise, you can buy it anywhere books are sold. That is a good deal. Yeah. Well, is this your first and only book, or you got others planned? Uh, no, I did the novel a few years back. Uh, it was published by a small press uh, down in Texas. 
Uh, and I've published uh, a lot of smaller things uh, over the years. In fact, quite a few. Cause I've written for magazines on a regular basis. And right. Some of those things I've gotten into uh, Master of Deception. So do you have other books that you've got on the, that you've got planned, or is this can you retire? This be gone? Uh, oh no, no. I'm always writing. I got two other books. One book is finished. It's called a Staged Influence, and they're essays on the nature of mesmeric control, uh, both on and off the stage and in culture. And uh, after that, I'm currently working on a novel it's called Affiliated Shadows. It's about uh, a number of people who have absolutely no connection with each other, but they cross paths in odd ways. <laughs> well, it's good. I don't like to read books myself, but Monica did get the book and she read it. I mean, she'll knock out a book in a day. So it doesn't matter how thick it is, she does it. And then she gave me the summary of it, so I understand a little bit about what the book is. Oh, okay. and, uh, our oh. mutual friend, David Stahl, I know oh. he got the book and he's very intrigued with it. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's out there interested, grab yourself a copy of The Master of Deception by John Ivan Palmer. Jipper, I call you Jipper because John Ivan Palmer, that's kind of how that got in case people are wondering why I'm calling you Jipper. <laughs> well, I, I've been trying not to call you crypto because that's the <laughs> name that makes sense between you and me. So I won't use the word crypto. Crypto. Well, you know, they got that cryptocurrency going on and I had to get on my phone and I got the app just because of the name crypto. Okay. Nobody knows what it means except for you and I. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, John Ivan Palmer, I appreciate you taking the time. If you want to stay on the line, I'm going to put you into the green room and sign this off, and we can have a chat after. But thank you for sharing. Is there anything else that you, any parting thoughts that you might want to share? Uh, yeah, I'd like to see you do the rat, but I know you're not going to do it. So just for, okay, there we are, there we are. Okay, yeah, that's that's my parting thought. The rat. Okay, John Ivan, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen, boys and berries. That was my friend, John Ivan Palmer, and his most recent book. He's had some before. He's got some more coming. And I'm assuming if you want to just Google the keyword John Ivan Palmer, you can find out a lot about this man. Um, he's like a walking encyclopedia. I'm always, I've always been fascinated by this gentleman. So that's it for today. Peace, love, and happiness. I'm going to beam this up to the universe and propagate it out to the world and let people find it. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day. Be well. Be safe. Be kind, be nice, and have fun.